Welcome everyone to another episode of Stories of a Colorful World, Authors Conversations. I am Kanika Mobley and joined by my sister, Vanessa, Mo Vanessa Mitchell. <laughs> and we are the co-founders of Stories of a Colorful World. So if this is your first time, welcome. Hello, happy Thursday. And if you are rejoining, then welcome back. So we just like to start off just telling people a little bit about who we are. So we are an online children's bookstore and we focus on carrying books with um, BIPOC characters. So that's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And we aim to amplify authors from those same diverse groups. So because we believe that diverse representation matters and the images and stories that kids are exposed to really matter, so we aim to use this platform to kind of highlight those authors and because there's so much great content out there um, from both traditionally published authors and self-published authors. So tonight we are honored to be joined by award-winning author Tamika Fryer Brown. Tamika, we are such big fans of your work. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I was really excited to receive the invitation to be here. Absolutely. Um, we already said we could always find us speaking about my cold plum lemon pie bluesy mood. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So can we, can you first just start off by um, telling us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, um, again, name is Tamika Fryer Brown. I am a picture book author. I currently have three books on the market. My first one is called Around Our Way on Neighbor's Day, and it's illustrated by fine artist Charlotte Riley Webb. My second one uh, that you mentioned is My Cold Plum Lemon Pie Bluesy Mood. And it is beautifully illustrated by Shane Evans. And my most recent book is Brown Baby Lullaby. And it recently, I'm excited to say, won the Anna Dudney Read Together uh, Award. And so that was exciting. And it is has gorgeous illustrations by A.G. Ford. So, so those are the three books that I have on the market now. And I'm fortunate to have three more on the way. 12 Digging Doorbells, which is gonna be about black family gatherings. I know you're gonna love that one. I'm so excited. It's illustrated by Ebony Glenn. Y'all, I saw the sketches. It is amazing. You're gonna really love it. And then um, I'm stepping my toe into the nonfiction waters and I've got a book coming out, Shirley Chisholm, Not Done Yet. And that's illustrated by Nina Cruz. Uh, and I'm excited about that. I saw those sketches there, Jimmy. yep. And then that flag uh, is coming out and it is about the Confederate flag and, uh, and the impact that it has on black people and, and our children because they're not excluded from, um, from the pain and the trauma that emblems like that, um, you know, have on us. So, um, and that's gonna be illustrated by Nicholas Smith. And so, yeah, that's who I am. Um, been writing picture books for, gosh, it's been since 2008. So you do the math <laughs> that long. <laughs> yep, and that's me. Oh, so congratulations on your award. Uh, that, that's awesome news. Um, so we're going to take you way back. Well, that, sorry, we're going to take you back. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. It's way back, it's way back. Yeah, it's way back, and that was too much. That was too much. Um, but we're going to take you back and just ask, you know, as who, how were you as a child, as a reader, as a writer? You know, what kind of sparked your interest in, um, you know, writing children's books uh, of all genres? Mm -hmm. Well, it really happened more as a parent than it did as a child. As a child, you know, I read books, of course. Um, I remember, you know, the Dr. Seuss, and when I was a tween, I read the the, the Sweet Valley High and all all that stuff. But there was there, I can't say that there was one particular book um, in my childhood that really stood out as something that inspired me to want to write. Um, in fact, it's it's funny. 
growing up, I really didn't realize that writing was a job or that people like human beings actually wrote the books. I just kind of thought, you know, here's a book, I'm going to read it. It's weird, but it's true. Um, I think it's because we, we, we're, we were raised in an era where, you know, there were certain jobs, you know, you're going to grow up to be a, a teacher, a doctor, or, you know, an accountant, just specific jobs, but the creative jobs, you know, that, I mean, that wasn't even on my radar. So, but it wasn't until I was an adult and I had children and, um, our family really just felt it was really, really important to read. And so we read every day, multiple times a day. So I found myself reading hundreds of, of children's books. And, um, and I was a stay-at-home mom. I had left the workforce and um, had three kids. And I was at that point where I was really, I loved being um, the privilege I had of being a stay-at-home mom. But I was, I was, I was needing something more than mommyhood at that particular point in time. And I was trying to find what it was that I would do. Um, so that was for me. And so I was reading a children's book to my youngest daughter one day and I was like, this is it. Um, I didn't think of, of writing as a job but I always knew that I was good at it. And I loved the art form of picture books. And so I said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. And that is, um, that's what inspired me to do it. And I thought it was going to be so easy because I thought I was just so good. And um, <laughs> I, 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 I thought I was, you know, I sat down and I wrote this, this children's book in like a day or so. And then I went through all, you know, we watched the reading rainbow. I'd heard of some of these names, Dial and who, Dial, who else was it? Probably Penguin. And I went through the books of my favorite books of my kids. And I was like, okay, yeah, there they are, Dial or whatever. And so I picked out of like four and I got online, I figured out how I was supposed to submit. And back then you had to do a SAISI with your submission so that they could send you your manuscript back if they didn't want it. But of course I knew I wasn't gonna get any of those SAISIs back because they were gonna be fighting over my little story. <laughs> and suffice it to say, I got a lot of SAISIs back um, with you know rejection letters. So I just didn't get any response at all. Um, but I was, you know, I, I wasn't disheartened um, disappointed a little bit, but not disheartened because I was still excited that I really thought I had found what it was I was meant to do. So that's just kind of how I got involved in writing. Very cool. Yeah. So your first kind of like published book was was around the, around our way on Neighborhood Day. Mm -hmm. And so what created or inspired like that idea to think like, okay, this is the one that I want to to create? I think, well, literally it started out as an ABC book and it was ABCs Around Our Way. And I was at that um, early phase of writing and I was um, I was just always writing. I had notebooks by my bed and I was always jotting stuff down. And so my mind was always on writing. And one morning, right before I like fully woke up, I got this rhythm in my head and so I jotted down a rhythm. It was like, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I didn't even have words at first. I was just writing down the rhythm. And then, um, then the words came. And so I had like a whole first verse worked out before I got out of the bed. And after I took the kids to school, um, I came back and I think it was like within 24 hours, I had a full first draft. Um, so that's the literal thing that inspired it. But when I look, um, Overall, uh, I think I grew up in Miami, Florida, which is a very um, diverse place. And Around Our Way on Neighbors Day is about a close-knit, diverse, multicultural neighborhood. So I think that that you know, life experience that I had is probably what really motivated that story. Mm -hmm. So then you came with it was the next book, My Cold Plum, Lemon Pie, Boozy Moon. So then you came with that. So what inspired that? Because that book resonates with us because each month we pick a theme and this month's theme was wellness and mental health and you know, highlighting books that cover topics related to, to mental health. So how did you come up with the theme for this book? Mm -hmm. um, this one, literally, this, this tends to be like a literal way I came up with it and then what kind of informed it from my experience. So literally I was in, um, 
having a day where everybody was like getting on my nerves. I mean, everybody. And then, so I had to, at some point during the day, say, okay, Tamika, it cannot be everybody else. <laughs> it has to be you. And I say, yeah, I'm in a mood. And then my something just, you know, clicked in my head with that I'm in a mood. And I said, ooh, that would make a really good hook or title for a book. And so literally that is what inspired me to sit down and start crafting a story. Um, and as I started writing it, you know, my kids, when they were little, they grew up in Montessori school. Mm -hmm. And um, the theme was always um, about the whole child and valuing the whole child. And um, as you know, in uh, my Cold Plum Lemon Pie Bluesy Mood, uh, which is about emotions, all of our emotions, the happy ones and the not so happy ones, and giving voice to them and honoring them as a part of who we are. And um, so I think that that is probably, again, kind of what was going on in my mind as I was writing it, really wanting to validate children's emotions, all of them. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably really what drove the way I decided to craft the story. And then I love colors and then I married colors in there. And me, bright colors, just really, that's where I get my energy from. And so, yeah, I, I said, okay, I threw, I threw the colors in there too, so yeah. <laughs> Well, I told you the the I read the book and the mood spoke to me, but the colors of the mood specifically yes. spoke to me. I said, oh, oh, this is the mood I'm in today. I have my words now. I can tell yeah, you. We all have like different color moods, right? Like like Jamie's um kind of think of it like 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 his chill mood is like purple. Right. Right. And my chill mood would probably be more like green. You know, we all have different, different colors um, that inspire different feelings, I think, in us. But, um, but I think color does, is important. And it does that for pretty much everybody, no matter what, you know, you might have different things that inspire you different ways, but color is so important. And it's so, it's, it, it, it really is important in terms of just really thinking about younger kids too and being able to express their emotions or, you know, maybe not having the vocabulary for it, but can connect with that color in terms of like, okay, yes, this is how I feel. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes when I do a school visit, um, back when we used to do them in person, I have this exercise uh, where we write a poem together with a class. And then we may um, either pick one color and talk about what it, it sounds like, what it looks like, what it feels like, and go all, through all the senses. Or we may talk about the different emotions and have the class kind of, you know, come up with colors that, and they can then they can describe them that way. So yeah, to your point, color, you know, kids can kind of grasp onto that as it relates to communicating what they're feeling. Yeah, well, the communication is so important as well, right? Especially in this in this day and age, there's so much happening, right? There's, and there's so much that children are consuming. We as adults, you know, we can sort of compartmentalize, put it places, um, but children can't necessarily do that, right? And so they're absorbing all of these images, all of this, all of the news and everything that's going on. And I can understand the the challenge with expressing how you're feeling, what mood you're in. And what I think that's what I loved about the book is that he could identify what the mood he was in and why. And it was okay, right? We all go through different emotions. It was okay. So all of them, every every single mood that he has, and like I said, the happy ones and the ones that weren't happy, they're all okay. And I and I like to communicate that too. There is no such thing as a bad mood. There's no such thing as a bad feeling because every feeling that we have serves us in some way. When you talk about sadness or anger or fear, um, they serve us to know what we wanna do, what we don't wanna do, what we wanna stay away from, how we wanna be treated and therefore how we should treat other people. You know, all of our feelings serve us in that way. And so, yeah, um, I, I am, really happy that um, my cold plum lemon pie bluesy mood can serve as a tool to help children, um, you know, to be a conversation starter, right. to help children um, figure out how to express whatever it is that they might be feeling uh, at a given point in time. So, yeah. 
how how are your children with expressing? Do they how are they expressing their <laughs> mood? And was that any sort of inspiration in this as well? My kids don't have a problem. Sometimes I'm like a slow year old. <laughs> they don't have a problem express, expressing themselves. But that's but that's a good thing. They're 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 grown now. They're my youngest is 18. Well, will be 18 in a few weeks. So um so they don't have a problem expressing themselves now. But um I think that um again, just kind of the way they were brought up, um valuing, you know just valuing the whole child, both at school and then at home, because I was a young mother, right? And so I had my kids involved in this learning philosophy. And so I kind of picked it up too. And then, you know, I, my mother, let me communicate like whatever it was, you know, you had to be respectful. Right. Sometimes I crossed the line a little <laughs> <laughs> but but overall I didn't you know you had to be respectful but I could say and share what it is um what it was that I was thinking and feeling so I did grow up that way as well um so I yeah I think my kids um communicate um and I but I think I, I kept the tradition just you know just do it respectfully mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course <laughs> <laughs> Because I think that is something that kids of today have, you know, more opportunities to express them like that's that's part of the culture and like as we're also shifting and thinking about like mental health and expressing your emotions and doing all of these things, you know, people are trying to find ways to raise kids where they can communicate and have a way to, to share those emotions. Yeah. For sure. It, yeah, it's, it's times are better, I think, in that way these days, for sure. I would agree with so that. much of your work is rhythmic. Mm -hmm. So what is it about like poetry that connects most with you? I don't know. It's just the way that I best communicate in story. I think my writing is largely influenced by music. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I don't play an instrument, but I took chorus pretty much all throughout junior and high, uh, junior high school and high school. Um, so, and I, you know, I love music. I love lyric. I love lyrics. You know, I have certain genres of music that I'm more drawn to than others, but you can take me to a genre of music that I don't really care for. And if that song has good lyrics, okay, I'm, that's my exception. You know, I, I like that song. Um, so I'm drawn to, to rhythm I, I'm based on music and I'm drawn to poignant um, evocative lyrics. Okay. And so I think both of those things heavily influence the way I write. And then I know what my children responded to in all those books that we read. And I know what I respond to and when I read the books in language in rhythm, rhythm, even if it's not poetry, but if the language, um, the prose language is poetic, um, I respond to that in a really emotional type of way, which I think that that's what the strongest books, not saying that my books are the strongest, but you know, that's what the strongest books do. Um, they make you feel like something, something um, significant. So, yeah. So one of the, the, the uh, one of our intentions around the author's conversations, right, is to highlight authors um, that, that represent us with their content, you know, create content for us, by us, tell us stories from our perspectives, right, rather than someone else telling our stories and represent us in everyday life. Right. Um, and so what does diverse representation mean to you? Because we know that, you know, if we look at, look at the statistics, there are not as many books featuring diverse characters. Uh, and so for you specifically, what does diverse representation mean? Well, first, let me say what I think it is not. It is not and you alluded to it. Um, it is diverse representation is not simply painting a character's face brown. 
and maybe going one extra step and trying to find a so-called ethnic sounding name. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, telling a really generic story that anybody could be in, that's not um, true representation. Representation involves, um, it's, it's in the details, right? It's in the traditions that are depicted. It's in the, the language that is spoken. It's in um, the difference in the language that's spoken based on who you're talking to. Um, it's in um, the physical affectations. It's in, it, it's just in those really, the nuance and the cultural details that come through lived experience, which is why own voices is so important. Um, when you talk about those statistics, when you're talking about um, Black creators in general, we still tell less than 50% of the stories that are by us. And what does that mean? That means still in 2021, we are not controlling our own narrative. We are not controlling um, what stories are shared about us. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's not okay. And so we continue to do the work, you know, and that less than 50% um, represents progress. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we, we need to keep pushing till we get to numbers where we are commanding um, our own narratives. Uh, from a statistical perspective. And so that's why the work that you all are doing is so important. And it, that is why um, we encourage more black creators um, to get into the, into the game and, and, cr and create stories for our children. And then also diverse representation is more than one story. You know, we're, we're not a single narrative. Uh, we, we span every whatever thing you can think of. Um, we're we're just we're so diverse, even within cultures and within de demographic groups. And so um, the books that are published uh, need to represent that. You know, we are more than trauma. We are more than um, overcoming and struggle. Um, not saying that though there's not a place for those books. We just need a, a different balance. Um, and what comes out on an annual basis for our children. Yeah, our children and others' children too. Oh, 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 oh yes. Others' children, like they Absolutely. need to see us. They're more than one thing. Right. Right. It is equally yeah. important, you're absolutely yeah. right. It is equally important because, because we're planting seeds, right? right? We're planting seeds in all of our children because I firmly believe, um, this, this is why I think of this as a vocation for me, um, I believe that the change that we seek is going to come through our children, right? Because we've got to plant seeds that blossom um, in their hearts so that all of these things we're trying to get people to understand is just innate. It's a part of who they are. They don't have to think about it. They feel it because what we feel, we act on much more naturally. And so you are absolutely right. You know, it's for all of our children. It's equally important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think as you said, like we are starting to see some progress in like creation and and in addition to like there are more outlets for people to get their content out there. Mm -hmm. But what has your journey been in terms of, you know, getting your content um, out there or your recept uh, receptiveness of publishers or things like that for your um, work? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it is a challenge. I think whether you go the traditional publishing route or the independent publishing route, um, self-publishing, it's, it's, they both come with their challenges. With traditional publishing, you know, everything is so competitive. And then when you talk about, you know, we got, we got this small percentage for people of color, you know, that makes it even more competitive when that is the thought process or has been the thought process historically. So, um, but I never shy away from competition. I kind of like, it drives me. So that part is okay. Um, as I, you know, when I entered this industry, I was kind of clueless about, um, issues of, of representation and, um, you know, you know, just other issues that we, we come up against as creators of color. I just want to tell my, my little story, <laughs> but, but as I've, um, been around for a while, 
I recognized that maybe some of the things that I was just like, oh, the story just wasn't good enough. Maybe uh, I was being pigeonholed, you know, a bit. Um, I tell you an interesting story, that flag um, that's coming out in 2023 with Harper Collins, I wrote that story like six years ago. And it was pretty much very similar to what, what I have now. And um, nobody thought it, it was appropriate. You know, it was not the topic that should be, you know, to written for, for our younger kids. And, um, and so I just put it away. And then life happened and, you know, the world kept going the way it was going. And so then in 2020, the time was right. Um, and I sold it and I sold it to a black editor. Um, and, um, but it, but it went to auction to be fair. There were, there were other uh, people who, who, um, at this point in time were interested in buying it, um, as well. So, um, so I don't, I don't know the, I think it is a challenge. Um, here's what I think the, ch the challenge of traditional publishing is. And we, I think we talked about it a little bit. Um, the fact that everything is so white, like 80, 80, 75, 80% white, that, that is the lens that they have been looking through everything um, with, you know, and then, you know, I don't connect with this story. Well, okay, maybe we understand why you don't connect with this story, <laughs> right? So that's where we need more um, BIPOC uh, editors and executives and sales reps and whatever job there is um, so that people will connect with our stories and they know how to push them and promote them. Um, so yeah, there have been, I guess, challenges like that that I didn't even realize until I started getting more involved in, with the Brown Bookshelf. You know, I'm a member of the Brown Bookshelf and I, oh my gosh, there's some amazing people, members of the Brown Bookshelf that I learned from constantly. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's those challenges, but, um, but there's also so many people, uh, like Vanessa Mitchell and Kanika Mowgli and, um, who are doing work to make change that I, I'm just excited about where, um, traditional publishing is headed right now. I'll put a plug in the Brown bookshelf has, um, an initiative going on called amplify black stories where we have a storyteller cohort. Um, they applied for it and we, we chose, I think it's like 24 storytellers and they are, some are um, independently published, uh, traditionally published, new, whatever, um, uh, Vanguard, we have all levels. And then we have um, a publisher track and we're communicating our needs. And it's, they've, they've got faculty and all that. It's, it's a groundbreaking um, program. And what we're trying to do is increase the focus on marketing mm. our books because that is an area that has really um, fallen short. Publishing, traditional publishing has fallen short in marketing our books, in knowing how to market our books. Mm. And so, um, and so that, that has been a challenge from the beginning for me. And so I'm, I'm really excited that um, there's an emphasis on that now. And, and I'm hoping that we make progress. Um, what, did you, what did you ask? Did you ask me something about the, the, the independent publishing side? I'm not as familiar with all of the workings of that, but, but I, can, I can just know from common sense that there, there's challenges there as well, you know, with, with marketing, with perception, um, just all of that is, as well. So there's, there's challenges, you know, what, whichever way you go, but the key is to just not be uh, disheartened and, and keep it moving and keep, keep working hard to accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Cause, cause our babies need them. Yeah. They need us. Yeah. That, that follows into my next question because I was going to ask what what advice would you give to someone who has the idea or the story in their head they haven't maybe put it to pen to paper just yet or um, you know haven't followed it through what would your advice be to them? Um, well, first of all, I say uh, the best writers are prolific uh, 
or not prolific, but um, extensive readers. So read whatever it is that you're trying to write, read a whole lot of it, read like twice as much as you think you should read because through the reading you're absorbing um, the all of the things about the genre that are in common. And you're also seeing what the differences are. And maybe you're also seeing where the gaps are where you can fill it in and be unique in what you present. So read, that's, that's like foundational. And then um, like accompanying with that, learn your craft. Some of that craft you're going to, going to absorb by reading, but also you have to be really focused and intentional about learning the craft of writing. And in this case, writing for children. So Google Google has a whole lot more stuff on it now than it did when I was coming out. <laughs> So you can Google a whole lot of stuff with articles. You There's books out there that you can, can um, purchase. Um, so there's a lot of free resources to help you improve your craft. Um, but then there's also the element of community. You can improve your craft through community. Mm-hmm. And um, so like there's the organization, I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with it, Quelly, K-W-E-L-I dot org they have a wonderful conference for this is this one is specifically geared towards BIPOC creators um black indigenous black indigenous people of color so um i think their conference is in april of every year so you know start checking them out now go on their website they have events throughout the year um they have other resources that is a way to to hone your craft as well as learn the business Mm -hmm. because that's another thing we don't do we don't focus on learning the business of publishing which is equally as important I think is learning the craft of writing the story so um that do you got Quayley you've got black creators in Kitlet who has only they've only been around for like a little over a year Mm -hmm. but they are doing amazing things to bring um black creatives in this game to grow um, to grow our skills. They have access to top e- editors and agents and people coming in to speak to the group. Um, so follow them on Twitter. It's B-C-N-I-N, Kidlit. Um, that is their handle. And I know that there are times throughout the year that they open up member for membership, new membership. So just follow them so you can be aware of when that time takes place. And so they're really good. And then the last thing I would say, SCBWI, that's what I had when I was entering. And they are not focused on um, as much on BIPOC creators, um, if you know, we're talking about community in that way. But the, I think that they are really helpful as it relates to um, learning some things about craft and learning some things about business. So, um, you know, that is an option as well. Look at, look into all of them and figure out what what fits you. But, um, but mostly it's don't give up. You know, focus, do the work, don't give up. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> So you talked a little bit about um, community. Um, how did you feel about your work being featured in the We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices anthology? I was so excited. I was excited to even have been invited among all those stellar, amazing, uh, phenomenal, whatever other adjective I can think of, mm-hmm. creators um, to have been asked to participate was an absolute honor and so yeah I I that's my only like middle grade credit (laughs) that I have right now um so yeah and then to be I think we talked about before uh Inosanto Nagata was the one who illustrated my entry um where are the good people and he did an amazing job and that was interesting you know his illustration has um people pulling down a Confederate statue. And um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, I was she in, she was at Chapel Hill, I think at the time, maybe. Um, and when they took down that, that statue. <laughs> so that was really um, like our mirroring life and, and it was amazing, so. 
That's great. So you have, I know you have a couple of books coming out. So any other projects, any other, um, I know the Shirley Chisholm book, mm -hmm. fam that flag. Family Gathering. The yep, Family yeah. Gathering, That Flag. So that's that three flag. books that are coming out. Okay. And then I'm, to, I'm still working on, um, I'm, I'm still working on like, like back matter and stuff like that for those books. And I do have a couple other books that I am working on, but I am superstitious about talking about something <laughs> that has not been finished, let alone sold. So uh, <laughs> I shouldn't probe. I shouldn't try right. to <laughs> but I know dodge a little bit. So um yeah. So yeah, no, but um but those are the three that are coming out. And yeah, I'm just, you know, it's a, always a process. You're always trying to keep your pipeline going. I had a spate of like six years between my second and my third book because mm -hmm. life, because kids, because, right. and that happens. And I was totally cool with that. That's, mm -hmm. you know, I always said that I kind of wrote on the side. My full-time gig was, was being um, a parent, but now that they are all grown. Yeah. We flip that around. Ah. <laughs> I'm trying to keep that pipeline going. <laughs> <laughs> so when your kids were younger did you did you guys have any like story time rituals read every day like multiple <laughs> times a day always read at night we always did all the voices it's like my mother who's probably watching now because she's like my <laughs> biggest cheerleader um she she talk about how like she would come to town and she would read a book. I probably was my oldest daughter. And then she just take the book from her and close it. Cause she wasn't doing all the voices, <laughs> right? We did the voices, we got into it. So reading was um, was just such a, a strong part of our family. So like, you know, when they came home from school, we'd read a book, when they went to bed, we'd read a book. I mean, we read all the time, so yes. Read, and I, and I, and I want to say, I think reading is the foundation of all academic success. I don't care if you got a STEM kid, if you got a, a creative kid, I don't care. Read to them, talk to them when they're babies, before they even come out of the womb, really. Talk to them, sing to them. Um, language, it is so important. Um, in their future academic success, let them read the, the books, let them read the pictures. They don't, if they, if they don't have to read the words, let them read the pictures. That's pre-reading, that's building yes. literacy skills. That's letting them fall in love with books. Um, yeah, just, yeah, important. Yeah, books were important in our house. Hold. Do you have any books that you're reading now? Me personally? Are, I'm always reading a, a kid's book of, of okay. some type. Um, Let's see, what is the last, the last book I read, and I was kind of late to the game, adult book, was Trevor Noah's Born a Crime. Mm -hmm. I know that's been out for a while, mm -hmm. but that was probably the last book that I actually, adult book that I read, and I, and I thought it was a really good, well-written book. And, um, and then I've got Eddie Gloud's um, book, and I forget the title, that I'm, that I'm, is the next book that I'm going to try to read. Okay. So, yeah, but I'm always, I've always, you see this shelf. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got some children's books I'm reading. <laughs> so I think, I think most parents have, you know, go through those phases where kids go through that phase of wanting to read the same book over and over again. So were there any books that you can remember that stayed on the kind of like repeat or like this book again? <laughs> Okay, you want the this book again book that I liked or the this <laughs> book again book that I was like, oh Lord, you read it. <laughs> Tell my okay, so the ones that I like, we'll talk about the ones that I like. We'll be positive. Um, I love, I remember that my, I don't know, I think it was my youngest daughter. And this is one of my favorite books. I consider it a mentor text. Is um, Jacqueline Woodson's Our Gracie Aunt. It is such a well-written book. It is about, um, a, a brother and a sister who have to go stay with their aunt because their mother is unable to care for them at this particular point in time. And um, it is so beautifully written, um, takes a sensitive topic and it treats it so lovingly and, 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 and lot, not, not, not depressing at all. Um, I, I, I love that book. So I, I, that's one, and my, my daughter wanted me to read that, you know, 
again, um, and I didn't have any problem with that. Books that we read, like a whole lot, Kevin Hickett's mouse books. Yes. And you know, you know, I'm all about, you know, decreasing the number of, you know, animal books and it, making more human people of color books. But mm-hmm. if we gotta have some animal books, we need those Kevin Hickett's mouse books. They are really good. He really understands children and the humor and he doesn't talk down to humor I mean to children he uses big vocabulary words and um we read those a lot so um that was something that we read a lot so yeah um those were always favorites in my classroom too I think chrysanthemum was one that we just read oh girl I got the voices for chrysanthemum (laughs) And envious and begrudging and discontented and jaundiced. You know, that we, I we love. <laughs> Santhemum, Wimberly Worried. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, Lily in that purple. Plastic. Oh, Lily. <laughs> Poor Lily. <laughs> <laughs> Lily. Yeah. Oh. I think that's awesome. So one of the things that we do um, is we pick, pick a theme every month. Um, and we try to highlight books that speak to that theme. So we've done creativity. Um, but this month for, for May is wellness, being Mental Health Month. Um, so we're trying to highlight books uh, that focus on mental health topics and issues uh, for children. So we always ask the authors, what is a word or phrase or quote um, about what wellness speaks to you? And however you view wellness, whatever that means to you. Mm-hmm. I think the word care is what comes to mind when I'm thinking about wellness. Um, and it, then that applies to mental health, physical health, spiritual and emotional health, focused care, self-care and care for others um, is the key to, to obtaining wellness in all those different areas. Sometimes we just like let life happen and we're not focused on caring for ourselves for our, our minds, for our spirits. We're not focused on caring for, with our, for our relationships with other people and relationships are really important to um, mental health and wellness as well. So care, I think would be my word. I like that. Awesome. So just so people know, um, how can they find you? How can they stay connected and find out when that Shirley Chisholm book is coming out or that flag? Um, what can they do to stay in touch with you? Well, I have, I'm on all the social media. So um, I got a Facebook page, Tamika Fryer Brown, children's book author. Um, and then I've got Twitter. I am T Brown Kidlit. That's T-E-E Brown Kidlit on Twitter. And on uh, Instagram, I'm Tamika Fryer Brown. And my website is TamikaFryerBrown.com. So um, yeah, those are all the ways you can find me. That's awesome. And we'll make sure we put all of that in the the comments below. Um, Tamika, this has been such a a fun conversation. Um, I love your energy. (laughs) Thank you. Look, look, it worked, y'all. It did. It did. I love love your energy. (laughs) But this has been a fun conversation. And, um, you know, what one of the things we're we're happy to highlight, and I'll talk about because we have a couple events happening this weekend, but we're going to be, we'll have your book. Uh, in stock for sale at our events. Uh, so certainly we want people to pick up um, My Cold Plum Lemon Pie Bluesy Mood, as well as, you know, we'll have that in stock, but then definitely to look for your other books. Um, and then we also have uh, your book available through our bookshop uh, bookstore. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we're making sure that we support you and, and we, we love and enjoy your work. I mean, as an adult, I, I really enjoyed your work. So, <laughs> so thank you for sharing that with us and the world. Um, and we look forward to all the, all the content you have coming out. Um, we'll definitely keep an eye out for those things. I uh, so want to thank you again for, for joining us and spending your evening with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for all those that tuned in, thank you for joining us as well. Um, 
please take a look out at our website, uh, www.storiesofacolorfulworld.com. Uh, there's a link to our bookshop bookstore uh, where we're carrying Tamika's book. So please, uh, please, please, please support her uh, as, as well as us. Uh, we also have a newsletter um, that highlights all the events that we have going on or any activities that we have going on. So we want to specifically talk about two events. So this is a busy weekend for us. Um, so I will be in Atlanta uh, on Saturday from 12 to 5 p.m. at the Atlanta Indie Market. Uh, it's on the west side of the Beltline, for those that are familiar, uh, at the Best End Brewery. So I'll be there from 12 to 5. So please come out, uh, join us. It should be a beautiful day in Atlanta, not too hot, which is nice. Um, so definitely come join us. And then Kanika on Sunday, uh, the 30th, will be at the Black Wall Street Brooklyn pop-up uh, and that is at 333 Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn and she'll be there from 1 to 6 p.m. Uh, so either you're in Atlanta or New York definitely stop by we'll have lots of children's books titles uh, and we also have some of the titles that we've highlighted during the May month where we focused on wellness uh, as, as well as a bunch of other titles. And then the last big event um, in, in celebration of Juneteenth uh, Kanika and I will both be in Atlanta, uh, so we're going to be we'll doing. The, we'll be together <laughs> again. Um, it's been a while because of COVID; it's kept us apart. Uh, but we'll be together again at the Juneteenth Atlanta Parade and Music Festival. So it's a three-day event uh, at Centennial Olympic Park. Uh, so please join up, join us, uh, come out, support. Uh, again, we'll have lots of titles available uh, for sale. Um, so I think those are all of our events, but again, if you're not joined, if you've not joined our newsletter, that's available. You can sign up through our website, www.storiesofacolorfulworld.com. Tamika, again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and for everyone who's joined us, thank you. And we hope you guys have a good night and we'll see you next week at our next conference.